Good afternoon. You know, the, the best part, well, there are a lot of great parts to today, but uh, perhaps at this hour, is the fact that you have remained enthusiastic, energized, and I know it's because you're anticipating the drawing here at the end of the session today uh, for the Ideas Festival, but thank you so much for your undivided attention, for your continued engagement, and now it's uh, a privilege for me to be able to introduce uh, Henry Cisneros, Chairman of American Triple I Partners and the former Secretary of the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development. And I think he just came in behind me here as I'm making the introduction because he became the first Hispanic American mayor of San Antonio, Texas. And I have to say that for those of us from California who are watching the emergence of this great leader from uh, the California perspective, it was inspiring, it was motivating at the time and continues to be so as a trailblazer, as a leader, an innovator, and someone who brought many new ideas to local government and beyond. He helped build or rebuild the city's economic base, as we've heard earlier in the session, and spurred the creation of jobs through massive infrastructure and downtown improvements. He then went on to become the Secretary of the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development and has been credited with revitalizing uh, many, many of the nation's public housing developments and with designing policies which contributed to significantly increasing the nation's home ownership rate. Secretary Cisneros is an important partner to the A-List team. He was responsible for bringing the Aspen City Action Lab to his city of San Antonio and has become an important leader and thought partner to our program. Please, ladies and gentlemen, join me in welcoming Secretary Henry Cisneros. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, my friend. Gracias. Thank you. Gaddy, thank you very much, and thank you for your public service. Gaddy was, uh, as many of you know, supervisor, uh, which is the county leader of Orange County, California, uh, and, and a pioneer, truly a pioneer in, in, in breakthroughs in uh, Latino politics in California. I'm very proud to uh, be able to introduce my colleagues on this panel, uh, all of whom are very qualified to speak to this important subject that we're going to take up here, which is... How do we accomplish the things that we've been talking about this morning and not hurt people who are already in the neighborhood, not displace people, not uh, damage people and their hopes and their ambitions? Very, very, very important because when you think of it, what is the point of doing Latino economic development and enhancing incomes if in the process we have to hurt some traditional Latino families? That just doesn't make any sense. So. This is a very important piece of the discussion. Let me introduce first uh, the Assistant Secretary of the Department of Housing and Urban Development, Elizabeth De Leon Bargava. Would you please come forward? <laughs> Madam Secretary, please have a seat. The Secretary <coughs> was the New York State Deputy Secretary for Labor and Workforce. She has about a 20-year history of substantial public positions, the first Latina to hold that job, Assistant Secretary also served as Senior Advisor to the Speaker of the New York City Council, Deputy Commissioner of the New York City Department of Small Business Services, Assistant uh, Counselor at the New York State Office of the Attorney General, 20 years worth of public service right in the center of the bullseye of what we're talking about today. M Madam Secretary, thank you for joining thank us. Please. You. Thank you. <laughs> Next, I want you to meet Ileika Burgos Flores, who heads an organization. She's a Dominican American activist, por favor, and founding executive director and CEO of Alapata, a place based organization in Miami working on wealth building and marginalized immigrant enclaves. And she's working on a whole series of difficult questions related to land, like uh, climate related ocean rise and the impact it's having on uh, marginalized communities. Uh, but she is very articulate on this subject of displacement. Please welcome Mileka Burgos Flores. <laughs> <coughs> and our third participant today is uh, a legend, uh, not only in Philadelphia, but in the country in Latino circles of community building his name is Reverend Luis Cortez, and he's the founder and CEO of a group called Esperanza. Please, Reverend, please join us. 
I'm a legend, huh? <laughs> you are. And when he, and when he started, uh, there was one person in the organization. Today there's 575 employees. And it's an organization that has built, uh, been built on community economic development, workforce, housing, immigration, and education in Philadelphia. And he is really expert, as you will hear, in, and, and has uh, developed in North uh, Philadelphia protections, protections for people who uh, are endangered by the fact that strong economic development is happening in the Latino areas of Philadelphia. So again, as I said, the subject is a very important one because there's real danger that a byproduct of many forms of economic development, community development, is the displacement of people who have been there. And it's just a, a kind of inexorable process that occurs as development occurs and suddenly values rise and property taxes become higher. People who live there or rent there are priced out. Sometimes people who've owned their home for generations, but suddenly the property taxes because everything around them is rising and they have to leave. Uh, or they are subject to predatory uh, purchasers who will offer them a high price even though the, the house is worth considerably more than that. Or renters who are pushed out because housing is purchased, a rental building is purchased and converted and, and, the, and the rents are doubled and tripled. This happens in Latino communities and many other poor communities. So as I said, it, it, it is counterproductive for us to be talking about community development if one of the byproducts is gonna be that kind of thing. How do we protect against it? If we were effective in coming up with models to protect the community, that would be a model that could be used in the rest of the country as inner city development occurs. Otherwise, many Latino communities are gonna follow the same pattern of people being pushed out. It's it would be very, very unfair. Uh, and so this discussion is not a sidelight. This discussion is not just an interesting aside on the Tuesday afternoon part of the program. This is an essential instrument to make the kind of economic development we're talking about truly inclusive and truly impactful in terms of touching people's lives, raising their incomes, and bringing them along in the economic development process. That would be unusual, that would be huge, that would be a major innovation. And I wanna thank Aspen and uh, Dominica Lynch and Gaddy and everybody else who's associated with this for putting this subject on the agenda. Uh, it reminds me of the days when I was Secretary of Housing and uh, the Secretary of Housing has like 14 divisions in the department, most of which are responsible for producing housing, like the FHA and like community development and, and others. But there's one that is generally thought of as an outlier, it's called fair housing. And it's never been given really full attention. But when you think of it, if you don't have attention to fairness in the housing markets, then the rest of the models don't work because you can't get people into neighborhoods if there's discrimination, if there's segregation. So fair housing is the device that's used to break that down. It seems to me there's a similarity here. You can't do community development and economic development and entrepreneurial development and business development and property development if, if you're not protecting the people who are there now who have made the legacy and the history of that neighborhood possible. So that's the subject matter that we're taking up today. It's integral to the process. So let me begin the discussion by asking each of our panelists to help speak to a question, and that is, do we need dis anti-displacement protections as we think about community development? Is this a valid concern? Have you seen it with your own eyes and can you begin to describe in practical terms some of what's happening? We'll begin, Reverend, with you. Great. Well, thank you. And uh, thank <coughs> you, uh, Aspen, for the opportunity. Uh, yet, I'm going, I am an advocate of defending the Latino community. So I'm gonna start off right away by saying, yes, we need support and we need to find uh, processes, policies, 
and economic policies to help create a response to community displacement. I'll start by quickly saying if you're from Boston, you're really now from Lawrence. If you <laughs> used to be from Spanish Harlem where I grew up, now you're from the Upper Bronx, Yonkers, or Jersey. If you were from Adams Morgan right here in Washington, D.C., now you're from Maryland or Virginia. Why? Mm -hmm. Because Latinos got pushed out of all those communities. And we are being pushed out of other communities in the Northeast. I'll speak for the Northeast. How does the process of being pushed out happen? How does it work? It's easy. Uh, capital will go wherever capital can replicate itself quickly and efficiently. Our communities are close. The new way of living is not to own a car, but to live near center city. Mm -hmm. So any of our communities, Latino communities that are situated with public transportation near the center of a city are at immediate risk of gentrification. The way it works is individuals see, you know what, I could take public transportation, the money I would put into a car and all these other things I'll use in restaurants and I'll use in theater and the arts. So it's not anti-Latino. They're willing to pay more? They actually pay less because they also know that they can acquire a property mm -hmm. at X dollars and if enough of their colleagues acquire a property at that same number, it will double or triple or sometimes even quadruple mm -hmm. over a period of but years. But how do the Latinos get pushed out? Because the rents go up? The rents go, well, there's the three. The house is sold from, I mean, the, the building is sold from under them? The building is sold from under them. Social policy, government policy, allows tax rates. In Philadelphia, anyone who invests new, in a new home, in building or rehabbing a home, gets a 10-year tax abatement. You know what happens when a home in the middle is surrounded by two homes that were invested over a million dollars? They don't get a tax abatement. So their taxes went up this year. Philadelphia taxes were going up in my neighborhood 41%, which led to a revolt, which has led to a setting aside of that increase. Mm -hmm. So social policy uh, following economic policy creates the economic environment where we, because we're close to the center of town or to where business is done or the arts areas, we then get displaced. Okay. I, would like say, I would say two things to that. Number one, policy drives behavior. And I'll give you an example of that. And number two, something that, that is, is very basic, it's that America, not just Miami or the, the, the cities that are represented here, need to confront their racist past. Usually our communities are in the, in the areas that are usually redlined, segregated, the, the lowest cost uh, rents usually, and usually those communities are very close to that city center, right? Because America used to live in suburbia. Mm -hmm. So now that it's hot to live close to the downtown, the, in, in that policy, I'm gonna go back to the policy, we have policies like opportunity zones where your capital is being invested in, in a way not protecting the, the community that has been there historically. Mm -hmm. So you have a policy that uh, uh, provides no protection to the people that are in place, Got it. but it gives the opportunity of capital to come in with no restriction of the displacement. You said you had an example. Yes, the example is opportunity zones. Okay. And the opportunity zones, for example, Alapada, most of Alapada is an opportunity zone. And we have rents of small businesses that has gone up 200%. Tell us where Alapada is. Alapada is located in the city of Miami. Um, it's basically uh, between the Miami airport and downtown. It has a main corridor called 36th Street that drives you right into the beach, so everybody wants to be in Alapada. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. in the past few years, we've seen the, the, the Wynwood model, and we've seen a lot of people from Wynwood, which is the neighborhood right next to it that everyone is so taken with, with the arts and so on, mm -hmm. our Basel. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And many of those people that can no longer afford Wynwood, yeah. which displaced also the Puerto Rican community in Miami, are moving into Alapada. We and Alapada tends to be uh, Dominican? A Dominican, predominantly Dominican, Dominican community, community, yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So all those art galleries, all those amenities, 
start coming to in our in to, is to very our community. Uh, entrepreneurial people. Many, yes. Many bodegas, many businesses. Mm -hmm. uh, are, are there, but they're in danger of displacement. Yes, they are in danger of displacement because ownership has never been a thing. Got it. And I think that when we talk about so they're displacement, renting, they're, even their businesses they're renting. The well, space. they are renting their storefront. Yeah. And even when they want to buy that storefront, right. it's, it's not available to them to purchase. Okay. So if one of my, the businesses that we support today asks the landlord, can I buy this building? The answer is always no. But if John Doe from, you name it, comes and say, let, let me give you an offer, they, they may possibly have a chance. So you're going to learn many things today, but one of the things I learned is that alipata means? Alligator. Alligator. And it makes In sense. In Seminole. Ali Pata. <laughs> Ali Gator. <laughs> Madam Secretary, uh, your sense of how important an issue this is. Mm -hmm. So I, I just have to say, because this doesn't happen often, is that you have two Dominicans on the panel. <laughs> so I just, you know, two Dominican in New York, this, women. You know, this two would be Dominican more women. <laughs> And we just found out that we lived on the same block in New York. But you know, um, all that to say, um, you know, I I feel like I prepared for the job that I have now, pretty much my 20-year career. And part of it is because as a child, my family was homeless. We I was born in the Bronx, and we moved to Washington Heights. And so, as a young child, I experienced <coughs> that. Um, I experienced, you know, the role of government. In, in my life, especially when we were looking for housing as a family. Um, then, you know, I went to law school, became an attorney, and one of my first big cases dealt with what was happening in Washington Heights, which is the neighborhood where I grew up. And it was a company which I won't name it, but the strategy that they actually had in their paperwork when they went to look for investors, was literally written that it was to, you know, find ways to decontrol the controlled real estate that is in New York. Rent control. Rent control, right. So they were <laughs> looking for ways to, you know, get those apartments so that they no longer had those protections in New York City apartments and, you know, I think in a lot of other cities yeah. throughout. There are a lot of protections for affordable housing. And they could raise the rents. And they can raise the rents. But in New York City, you can't decontrol, right? So you can raise the rents, but that apartment is still controlled. Mm -hmm. um, and it was a scheme. And for me to, as an attorney, to do, I focused on affordable housing and housing discrimination. I'm a civil <coughs> rights attorney. To focus on that and actually see that written in black and white, that that was the strategy. To, um, mm -hmm. to what we were discussing was, como le puedo decir? O sea, no podía dormir por las noches, ¿verdad? Because if I uncovered this, de verdad, how deep was the issue, ¿verdad? Yeah. Um, so it was just standard practice for developers. Exactly. And, mm -hmm. and so, so, you know, I, we continue to move, and then I find myself doing economic development. For, for neighborhoods. Um, and so little by little I realized, right, when we're thinking about the role that I'm in now for HUD, the truth is that all these positions have culminated to today. And when I think about what it is that HUD is doing, the truth is the real work is happening on the ground. Mm -hmm. And what HUD is really trying to do is respond and listen to what it is that has been working and not working. So when you think about the things that are needed, you think about the fact that a neighborhood starts to see the changes and immediately the fear is the rents are gonna go up. This is gonna happen. So Taxes. we try to find, to work with localities to figure out, okay, how do we control the rents? How do we, you know, people start getting evicted, right? Immediately you start the housing court. Ya nosotros sabemos las señas, ¿verdad? Housing court evictions start to go up. So immediately we're like, okay, so what do we need? Right, we need, you have to show cause. You can't just evict people to evict people, right? Mandándole 25 cartas y todas esas cosas. So we try to focus on that. But the other thing is that when a city needs economic development, because we need economic development in a 
our cities, throughout our neighborhoods. Nadie aquí is against economic development. Yep. And that's what I always say. The resources have not been in our community. And now when they come, they come with consequences? No, they should come with gifts. Right. 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 Mm -hmm. So what does, what does that look like? And so you know, part of it is you know, choice neighborhoods and thinking about how do we level the playing field so a community can become empowered to negotiate so let's talk, let's talk about some specifics here because we have about 10 minutes left in the Sorry. session. <laughs> no, 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 no. I want to, I want to leave the audience with yeah. some tools. I want folks to leave with some knowledge that there are actually positive things that can be done and what some of those might be. Yes. Um, and let me just say, <clears throat> I, I said earlier, this is an integral part of the model of development. I would go one step further. Anti-displacement measures need to be simultaneous with the economic development efforts. Yes. Because if they come later, mm -hmm. then it's too late. It's too late. Yes. The market forces are too strong, and you can't combat them. So whenever policies are rolled out that say, this is pro-economic development, this is pro-entrepreneurial, this is business loans, this is bonding, this is certification, whatever it is, the anti-displacement measures need to be in place. Or it's too late. Uh, so. Uh, I, I have in my possession here a, a, a what's called a toolkit from the University of Texas mm -hmm. Law School of 10 specific measures that should be taken uh, for anti-displacement. And they include things like community land trusts yes. and homestead preservation efforts mm -hmm. to actually help people uh, get the tools that they need in order to, to stay in their homes. Uh, and, and as I say, 10 different things that I'll ask uh, Dominica to share with the participants of the group. But we have experts who've gone through this. Yeah. So let's go back through the order here mm -hmm. and just get some specific examples of things that can actually be done. Well, I like the thought that there's a role for a Latino nonprofit in the community mm -hmm. and a Latino entrepreneur, and they're not the same. Mm -hmm. They just are not the same. So we all know you can give a man a fish or a person a fish, or you can teach him to fish. I'd rather own the pond so someone will fish for me. And that is what, we, what the nonprofit has to do. When the nonprofit owns the property as part of them, in our case, it's a land trust, the differential is that the land trust will maintain the property in Latino control. Or as we're calling it, we're starting to use the word historical cultural control. Yes. That, that's the way around black and brown. Because you know, they're, they're, you can't say black, owned, control. You can't say brown, because then we get accused of being racist. When it's white, it's okay though. So anyway, those, that was the personal opinion of the Reverend Luis Cortez. <laughs> so anyway, so capital, explain, explain, capital to develop the cap, I'm gonna, get, I'm gonna run through it quick. Yeah. The capital to develop the land trust. Capital needs to be developed to run, to do the land trust. That capital has to be patient and what I call elastic. Yes. Elasticity means it has a longer amortization rate. It couldn't have a balloon at the end. So that you're actually creating capital that meets the cash flow. Nuestra gente vive de semana a semana. That's right. So the cash flow, it can't just be a regular deal. One of the questions I have is, and one of the pushes is, can banks begin to do this? The regulators say yes. I served 20 years at the Federal Home Loan Bank. I speak to regulators, and they all have said, you can have a 40-year amortization. You can have a 40-year amortization with a 20-year balloon. So with a 15, 20, 30% balloon. So patient and elastic capital. Describe the, 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 the CDC buys the land. The yes. CDC buys the land. Le le and, and creates it in a such a, and leases it in such a way that it's affordable to the residents yes. or the b local businesses. Right. As mm -hmm. the businesses grow, the CDC helps that business right. buy another place. And let me say why buy another place. The, the, it is the nonprofit's role to be a springboard for our community, mm -hmm. not just one entrepreneur. So we will help an entrepreneur grow out of our rent into a, a traditional rent. And we learned that from helping individuals. We helped individuals buy homes where they paid 50,000 for a $100,000 home. 20 years later, 
They were blessed. They were able to sell three, those homes for 300000 I went to the closings to see if I could get $5,000 out of it. Y me dijeron, mijito, yo me voy para Florida. So, <laughs> okay. But so, the buyers were all Anglo. <laughs> Anglo, upper middle class, or lower upper class. So I contributed to displacement. So using but under the, the land trust, what would happen in that case? Under the land trust, they rent. We take a, a portion of their rent, put it into something called an IDA account, and we find a match. So even though they're renting, they're still building equity. Okay. So this is a new model, but it's actually taking two old things. They're still getting, and they're getting sure. equity, so when, it, when they move on, they, they have, take their equity to something. And that's they get, correct. They're getting and money. they get their equity. But the land stays. With but them. the land and the apartment stays in the hands of the community. And you can rent it to the next to the next family. Yes. At 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 a um, same low price. Affordable low price. That's yes. correct. I would agree with Spe specific very example. specific. Yes, ownership, ownership. But that ownership needs to come with affordability. So I do agree with the CLT model. But I would also say we need to have the community at the table. I think that we cannot build without having literally sitting down with the mm -hmm. commercial corridor mm -hmm. at the table and making sure that they are the investors. Right now we're building a, 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 an invest in, a investment model. We're working on a, on, a, on a platform to build an investment model where the businesses are the one who own and buy that property. Even if we, you know, Obviously, the nonprofit is, will be managing a lot of that, and we'll have partnerships. But the bottom line is that the community needs to not only be at the table to say, I want to rent the place, but how do we design that program? That program design needs to come from the community. Right now, we're using the uh, Main Street uh, approach, which has helped us a lot in organizing the community, working on the economic vitality, and also the design. The community needs to make the location their own, and I think that's something that makes a big difference okay. because they become their own advocates at the same time. Madam Secretary. A specific, so spe you, you see, you have a vantage uh, uh, point <laughs> to see a variety of methods. Any come to mind? So I would say, I actually want to piggyback off um, what Mileka was saying, which is we have a program called the Choice Neighborhoods. And the Choice Neighborhoods are grants that are actually provided to neighborhoods to be able to engage in a planning process for their neighborhoods along with investors and anyone else, right? It brings everyone to the table. And I think the most important thing when you're negotiating is that both sides have something to offer. So when a community has a grant that they can use for planning purposes, it's a different dynamic in engaging with you know, other investors that are coming um, into a neighborhood. And it also just empowers the community. We started with a planning grant years ago, and that's all we used to provide. But now there's a planning grant, and there's also execution and implementation. So I think, you know, specifically, there are places, I mean, of course, I always want to talk about New York, but don't me. But, you know, there's also like Arizona has, has done amazing work, and so has Louisville, Kentucky. They've been able to use the grants. Well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, you guys did amazing. They even got an award, the All-America City by National Civic League, so congrats. Um, and that's an example of, like I said, HUD listening to what the community needs and letting the community lead, but also trying to balance the conversation of equity. Let's yes. not forget, you know, the main reason why HUD exists is because our country's history is um, started by displacement, right? So we can't forget that inherent um, unfortunate undercurrent that, that still exists. And to the Secretary's point about fair housing and the importance of that work. Let me ask you about some specific tools that exist around the country and see whether you have any thoughts. One of them is called uh, Affordable Housing Strike Fund, which is money that's put together in the local government to help in the preservation of ownership for people who've been in an area where they're becoming under distress because of development around them and so forth. Do you know of any models of that nature uh, where, where the actual no. money has been put together? No, in Philadelphia we've won some tax policy issues where senior citizens who've right. lived in a neighborhood, their taxes will not be raised. Right. Right. And I think there's some other cases where it doesn't, you don't have to be a senior 
but you, if you have lived in the area for X amount of time, then your taxes are frozen mm -hmm. at the previous level mm -hmm. so that you don't become a victim of the displacement, of the, displacement yes. of the, of the uh, valuations that are rising yes. all and around you. And those are the so that would be, that would be yeah. local policies. Yes, right. local policies is part of the solution for displacement. Right, there's another uh, thing that I, I, I've, I've seen which is called community preference policy and it's where the local government actually works and helps to collaborate putting together a list of people who want to come back into the neighborhood mm -hmm. and when there are uh, uh, houses for sale and opportunity, they actually pick people off the list to get some advantage in coming back into the area as opposed to having mm -hmm. dramatic uh, segregation, ethnic change come, come in uh, because, because peop local people can't afford it. Uh, so there's, there's those kinds of things that are being done with the collaboration of local governments. Yes. So local government plays a very important role. As you said at the outset, yes. policy mm -hmm. is, is important. Yes. We have just a couple of minutes left for any questions from the floor on this important subject. Are there any questions? Yes, ma'am. I would say I would definitely love to look into that. Um, so I was sworn in May 12th. I'm going to put <laughs> But um, I actually am responsible for all procurement at HUD. That is actually under my portfolio. Yes, the pro yeah. And so um, I am, and I know it's very important also to the secretary. So it is definitely one of the things and that. I think that there are a lot of uh, similarities. Yes. So most of the audience is, is people who are from uh, one of the six cities, and they're actually working on an area-wide basis to focus on economic development and entrepreneurial development. Um, but as you think about the displacement issue and need to raise money, this report that I was mentioning focuses on the need to raise local revenues for that purpose. General obligation bonds are available to work on the displacement question. Tax increment financing can be used at the local level. Uh, there's some places have something called the Homestead Preservation Reinvestment Zone. That's another source of capital. Uh, general revenue from the city budget for that purpose and fees in lieu of density bonus. So there's, 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 there's financial mechanisms available but you have to work with the local government to get them. Uh, my personal opinion, it is massively important mm -hmm. unless we wanna just create just very unfair displacement that your plans in your six cities include some attention to the displacement question yes. that is created. And if you do that, it will be truly not just just, but it will be a model that others can use across the country as we see developing going forward. Look, we want development, as you said, mm -hmm. Madam Secretary. We want development. We want better incomes. We want people moving to the middle class. We want generational exchange of businesses across the generations of a family but we also want the heritage, the history of the people who live there to be protected and, and, and people not to be displaced. It would be just grossly unfair. So uh, I think the point of this panel is to encourage you to think in those terms and thanks to these panelists, I believe that's what we have done. Thank you very much. Thank you.
Gaddy, I think we are passing this back to you. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome back to the stage, Dominica Lynch. Hello, everybody. We went deep, didn't we? It was important. When we first launched this program, we thought we could do a light touch, but there's nothing light touch about being Latino, that's for sure. I want to thank Secretary Cisneros, Madam Secretary Bargava, for being here, and the amazing Reverend Cortez and Maleka. You got a little taste of America today, uh, whether it was the best practices around procurement or the opportunity to see one of our cities like El Paso win the Build Back Better Regional Challenge. The bottom line here is the power belongs to the problem solvers, and I'm quoting Bruce Katz. So the more problems you have, the more powerful you are when you solve them. So I am so delighted that you join us, that you stayed. I am the woman standing between your cocktail and then Diaz Festival tickets, so I want to be brief in what I want to say. But I want to thank you for your leadership, for caring deeply. Uh, this moment in time, we have to document it. This is history in the making. This is our history. This is us reimagining our communities. The uh, mayor of Colombia, Bogota, talked about the economics of happiness and how perhaps a country or a city like Bogota couldn't compete, particularly in the 80s or 90s, with a place here in the United States, any city in the United States, but boy, was he going to compete on the economics of happiness. We care about our families. We believe that we have the right to thrive. Not all of us are going to be billionaires, millionaires, but we all deserve to have a dignified life and places that we love and we can grow and prosper. Today, you heard words like intentionality. You heard words like policy drives behavior, the fair share of American prosperity against all odds. The Congresswoman kept saying that, against all odds. Also about rules of engagement for the next economy. Remember what I said, if we're not at the table, then we're where? On the menu. On the menu. So let's be at the table, let's reimagine our communities, let's work together. This is an invitation for all of you. We can't do this alone. I want to thank the sponsors. I want to thank all the speakers that were brilliant. I learned so much, and I'm humbled every day. I am the reluctant leader. I always want to replace me because I see some of these people. I think, oh my god, they know more. They could do more. But always know that I come with you with an open heart, genuine care. And my job is to uplift your brilliance. My job is to support your work. So please uh, call upon us to do that. Next year, we're going to have all our cities, we're going to turn this a little around, have the cities design their own panels to teach us what they've been implementing. Because talk is cheap. And we, again, what I said this morning, it's about inspired action. So thank you. Thank you to our sponsors. Thank you to the Latinos and Society staff. They're incredible. Give them a round of applause. <laughs> Eddie and Sinales, Yasmin, Diego. Sylvia, Jorge, Jesenia, Sonja, I could not do my job without you. So thank you so very much. So now I'm going to invite Ambassador Gaddy Vasquez to come up here to join me. And by the way, if you take a look at this book, you could see what the actions are for each city. So if there's a particular city, if someone you want to get in touch with, please let us know.